Joshua chapter 9 Now when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, the kings in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and bended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and mouldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, We have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. The Israelites said to the Hivites, But perhaps you live near us, so how can we make a treaty with you? Well, we are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, Who are you, and where do you come from? They answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon king of Heshbon, and Og king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, Take provisions for your journey, go and meet them, and say to them, We are your servants, make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and mouldy it is. And these wineskins that we filled were new. But see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors, living near them. So the Israelites set out, and on the third day came to their cities, Gibeon, Kephira, Beeroth, and kareath Jearim. But the Israelites did not attack them, because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders, but all the leaders answered, We have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we will do to them. We will let them live, so that God's wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, Let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the whole assembly. So the leader's promise to them was kept. Then Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said, Why did you deceive us by saying, We live a long way from you, while actually you live near us? You are now under a curse. You will never be released from service as woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, Your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you, and that is why we did this. We are now in your hands. Do to us whatever seems good and right to you. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites, and they did not kill them. That day he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly, to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose. And that is what they are to this day. Joshua chapter 10 Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhiah, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. 
Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, so Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them all along the road going up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jasha. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Makeda. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave at Makeda, he said, Roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. But don't stop. Pursue your enemies. Attack them from the rear and don't let them reach their cities, for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely, but a few survivors managed to reach their fortified cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Makeda, and no one uttered a word against the Israelites. Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, Come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. Then Joshua put the kings to death and exposed their bodies on five poles, and they were left hanging on the poles until evening. At sunset, Joshua gave the order, and they took them down from the poles and threw them into the cave where they had been hiding. At the mouth of the cave, they placed large rocks, which are there to this day. That day, Joshua took Makeda. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it. He left no survivors, and he did to the king of Makeda as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Makeda to Libna and attacked it. The Lord also gave that city and its king into Israel's hand. The city and everyone in it Joshua put to the sword. He left no survivors there, and he did to its king as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Libna to Lachish. He took up positions against it and attacked it. The Lord gave Lachish into Israel's hands, and Joshua took it on the second day. The city and everyone in it he put to the sword, just as he had done to Libna. Meanwhile, Horam, king of Giza, had come up to help Lachish, but Joshua defeated him and his army, 
until no survivors were left. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Lachish to Eglon. They took up positions against it and attacked it. They captured it that same day and put it to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it, just as they had done to Lachish. Then Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron and attacked it. They took the city and put it to the sword together with its king, its villages, and everyone in it. They left no survivors. Just as at Eglon, they totally destroyed it and everyone in it. Then Joshua and all Israel with him turned round and attacked Debia. They took the city, its king, and its villages and put them to the sword. Everyone in it they totally destroyed. They left no survivors. They did to Debia and its king, as they had done to Libna and its king, and to Hebron. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua subdued them from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza, and from the whole region of Goshen to Gibeon. All these kings and their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign, because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Joshua chapter 11 When Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this, he sent word to Jobab, king of Maidan, to the kings of Shimron and Akshaf, and to the northern kings who were in the mountains in the Araba south of Kinnereth, in the western foothills, and in Naphoth Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon in the region of Mizpah. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow I will hand all of them slain over to Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Merom and attacked them and the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them all the way to Greater Sidon, to Mizrafoth, Maim, and to the valley of Mizpah on the east until no survivors were left. Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. At that time, Joshua turned back and captured Hazor and put its king to the sword. Hazor had been the head of all these kingdoms. Everyone in it they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. And he burned Hazor itself. Joshua took all these royal cities and their kings and put them to the sword. He totally destroyed them, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Yet Israel did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds, except Hazor, which Joshua burned. The Israelites carried off for themselves all the plunder and livestock of these cities, but all the people they put to the sword until they completely destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took this entire land, the hill country, all the Negev, the whole region of Goshen, the western foothills, the Araba, and the mountains of Israel with their foothills, from Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, to Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and put them to death. Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time. Except for the Hivites living in Gibeon, not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites, who took them all in battle for it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel, so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy, as the Lord had commanded Moses. 
At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Debir, and Anab, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. So Joshua took the entire land, just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. Psalm 78 My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have taught us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God, and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation, whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. He did miracles in the sight of their ancestors, in the land of Egypt, in the region of Zoan. He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand up like a wall. He guided them with the cloud by day and with light from the fire all night. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the wilderness against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God. They said, can God really spread a table in the wilderness? True, he struck the rock, and water gushed out, streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us bread? Can he supply meat for his people? When the Lord heard them, he was furious. His fire broke out against Jacob, and his wrath rose against Israel, for they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Human beings ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. He let loose the east wind from the heavens and by his power made the south wind blow. He rained meat down on them like dust, birds like sand on the seashore. He made them come down inside their camp, all around their tents. They ate till they were gorged. He had given them what they craved. But before they turned from what they craved, even while the food was still in their mouths, God's anger rose against them. He put to death the sturdiest among them, cutting down the young men of Israel. In spite of all this, they kept on sinning. In spite of his wonders, they did not believe. So he ended their days in futility and their years in terror. Whenever God slew them, they would seek him. They eagerly turned to him again. They remembered that God was their rock, that God most high was their redeemer. But then they would flatter him with their mouths, lying to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Yet he was merciful. 
he forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time after time he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a passing breeze that does not return. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the wasteland. Again and again they put God to the test. They vexed the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power. The day he redeemed them from the oppressor, the day he displayed his signs in Egypt, his wonders in the region of Zoan. He turned their river into blood. They could not drink from their streams. He sent swarms of flies that devoured them and frogs that devastated them. He gave their crops to the grasshopper, their produce to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore figs with sleet. He gave over their cattle to the hail, their livestock to bolts of lightning. He unleashed against them his hot anger, his wrath, indignation, and hostility. A band of destroying angels. He prepared a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but gave them over to the plague. He struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, the first fruits of manhood, in the tents of Ham. But he brought his people out like a flock. He led them like sheep through the wilderness. He guided them safely, so they were unafraid. But the sea engulfed their enemies. And so he brought them to the border of his holy land, to the hill country his right hand had taken. He drove out nations before them and allotted their lands to them as an inheritance. He settled the tribes of Israel in their homes. But they put God to the test and rebelled against the Most High. They did not keep his statutes. Like their ancestors, they were disloyal and faithless, as unreliable as a faulty bow. They angered him with their high places. They aroused his jealousy with their idols. When God heard them, he was furious. He rejected Israel completely. He abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had set up among humans. He sent the ark of his might into captivity, his splendor into the hands of the enemy. He gave his people over to the sword. He was furious with his inheritance. Fire consumed their young men, and their young women had no wedding songs. Their priests were put to the sword, and their widows could not weep. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep as a warrior wakes from the stupor of wine. He beat back his enemies. He put them to everlasting shame. Then he rejected the tents of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth that he established forever. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From tending the sheep he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands he led them. Proverbs chapter 16 To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. The Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, He causes their enemies to make peace with them. 
better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. The lips of a king speaks as an oracle, and his mouth does not betray justice. Honest scales and balances belong to the Lord. All the weights in the bag are of his making. Kings detest wrongdoing, for a throne is established through righteousness. Kings take pleasure in honest lips. They value the one who speaks what is right. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, but the wise will appease it. When a king's face brightens, it means life. His favor is like a rain cloud in spring. How much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. The highway of the upright avoids evil. Those who guard their ways preserve their lives. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers, and blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. The wise in heart are called discerning and gracious words promote instruction. Prudence is a fountain of life to the prudent, but folly brings punishment to fools. The hearts of the wise make their mouths prudent, and their lips promote instruction. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. The appetite of laborers works for them. Their hunger drives them on. A scoundrel plots evil, and on their lips it is like a scorching fire. A perverse person stirs up conflict, and a gossip separates close friends. A violent person entices their neighbor and leads them down a path that is not good. Whoever winks with their eye is plotting perversity. Whoever purses their lips is bent on evil. Grey hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained in the way of righteousness. Better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord.